Hi, Barb. Barb, are you there? Yes, I yes, I am. Sorry, I'm navigating between different screens here. No worries, no worries. Can you see me clearly and can you see my slides right next to me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. That's what I wanted to check. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, then I'll be back at uh, uh, just in under 15 minutes, a couple of minutes before the top of the hour. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you.
So hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us um, <clears throat> for the December meeting. I know that uh, there were a couple of individuals that had some issues with um, registering for the Zoom to get the link. So let's give them maybe another minute or so to um, get started before we go ahead and do the quick introduction and um, start off in the meeting, if you don't mind. We'll go ahead and get started just so that um, we can go ahead and <clears throat> and uh, finish on time. So um, thank you again for joining us for the December um, ISACA meeting. Today, it's going to be a really uh, a special treat to talk with uh, Dr. Gleb. Um, it, it, first of all, Again, thank you, Dr. Gleb, for agreeing to meet with us during this time. I know during the holidays, it's really busy um, to get on people's calendars. So um, just thank you. Um, sure. um, to start off, again, it's my pleasure to introduce him. He was lauded as the office whisperer and the hybrid expert by the New York Times for helping leaders use hybrid work to improve retention and productivity while cutting cost. He serves as the CEO of the future of work consulting firm, Disaster Avoidance Experts. Dr. Gleb has also written seven best-selling books, including Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. He's published over 650 articles in prominent venues, such as the Harvard Business Review, Forbes, and Fortune. His cutting-edge thought leadership was translated into Chinese, German, Russian, Korean, Polish, Spanish, Vietnamese, French, and other languages. Dr. Gleb expertise comes from over 20 years of consulting and training. His clients include Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. His expertise also comes from his academic background as a behavioral scientist. Dr. Gleb taught for eight years as a lecturer at UNC Chapel Hill and seven years as a professor at Ohio State. Dr. Gleb is a proud Ukraine American and lives in Columbus, Ohio. We won't hold that against you because <laughs> I think many of us are Longhorn fans here. In his free time, <laughs> he spends abundant quality time with his wife to avoid his personal life turning into a disaster. So to help you take advantage of his groundbreaking expertise, we've asked him uh, to come in and share his um, thoughts on avoiding dangerous judgment errors and managing risk for IT professionals. Um, so please give me um, a few minutes to thank him again and uh, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Barb. Welcome everyone. So for context, I have done over, definitely over a dozen, I think, over 20 presentations for Isaka chapters. So I'm quite familiar with the kind of challenges that you are facing with dangerous judgment errors and managing risks. And so we'll be talking about specifically, I'll be focusing on the kind of challenges that have proven the most important to address for professionals like you in IT and in auditing and security. So that's gonna be the focus of the presentation. That's what you can anticipate. That's what you can expect. Okay. So without further ado, 
let's talk about what these risks are. Now, you've probably heard the phrase cognitive biases. So we'll be talking a lot about these specific cognitive biases, which are the dangerous judgment errors that stem from how our brain is wired. And we'll be talking about how they pose problems and what you can do to address these problems. So the first part of the presentation will be about some specific ways that we make mistakes. And then the second part of the presentation will focus on addressing these mistakes so that you know where you're coming, what, uh, where I'm coming from and where we're going. But first I want to talk about non-work contexts. Now, thinking about a non-work context, let's talk about driving. You have to, of course, drive a lot in San Antonio. This is definitely an um, important ability for you to have. And when you're driving, it's important to be confident. So when you're merging into a highway, you need to speed up, be confident, not slow down, even though it's tempting to slow down. Similarly, it's tempting to slow down when you're changing lanes, but you really need to speed up when you're changing lanes. So confidence is quite important when you're driving. And thinking about yourself and your ability to drive, would you say you're an above average driver or below average driver? So please go ahead. Are you in the, and vote in the poll that you see before you in Zoom? Are you in the top half of all drivers or are you in the bottom half of all drivers? Please go ahead and vote. Still voting. Give see about seventy percent participated. Let's give five more seconds. Make sure that you participate. Make your voice heard. And Skylin says, "Let's all be honest." <laughs> well, let's see how honest you were. So, eighty-eight percent of you are in the top half, and. 13% are in the bottom half. Of us. And so we could see, let's, so according to Skyline, <laughs> being honest, that probably is not reflective of full reality. Now, if we think about top half, 50 of us should be in the top half, right? And 50% of us should be in the bottom half. But the survey clearly shows it's not the case. 88% of us consider ourselves in the top half, and only 12, 13% of us consider ourselves to be in the bottom half. Now, why is that? What's going on here? What is the result showing this sort of discrepancy? Well, because it's confidence. So there's a tendency to be overconfident. And when you're thinking about managing risks and making good decisions in cybersecurity and auditing, overconfidence is a serious danger. Again, overconfidence is a serious danger. And we see that very much overconfidence is present among the people who voted in this survey. Our tendency to be way too confident is called the overconfidence bias. When people say they're 100% confident, they're only right 80% of the time. So on average, that's how often they're right. That's what the research shows. So people make serious mistakes about their ability to be right. When you're 100% confident about cybersecurity, your auditing process, the tendency to be right is only actually 80%. So we are way too confident. And Scott says he thinks in his, in his top half, but my spouse has pointed out my mistakes too often. Well, that should probably tell you something about the difference between your thinking that you're in the top half and the reality as shown by your spouse. And thank you for acknowledging that. So... The overconfidence bias is especially dangerous for those with more experience, for those with more authority. So for example, there was a study showing that doctors who, comparing doctors who were fresh out of medical school with doctors who were more senior doctors over 10 years out of medical school. And they were given the same case study to evaluate and give a prescription for what to do. And they got the case study right about the same rate, the senior doctors and the junior doctors. Now, the interesting thing about that, they got it right about the same rate. And uh, when you think about why, well, the senior doctors had a lot more experience and know-how, and the junior doctors had more fresh knowledge that's just going out of medical school. 
But the senior doctors were way more confident about their answers. They were much less likely to do additional tests and diagnostics. And that is an indication that the overconfidence bias is especially dangerous for those with more experience and authority. So if you've been in the field of cybersecurity, IT, if you've been in the field of auditing for a longer period of time, that might mean that you have more overconfidence than you should, and that's kind of a problem. So that is something to be worried about. And you should be especially concerned about overconfidence if you have more experience and authority. The key thing to realize is that most decisions come from our emotions. We vastly underestimate the role of emotions in our decisions. So recent studies show that emotions drive 90% or more of our decisions when we just do what naturally comes to us without using evidence-based decision-making strategies. And so that overconfidence is an emotion. So now I want you to take 30 seconds and just write down somewhere physically or on your keyboard, whatever, as you're taking notes on this presentation, where the overconfidence bias might be playing a negative role in your decision making. So go ahead, take 30 seconds and write that down, where the overconfidence bias might be playing a negative role in your decision making. In the meantime, just James said that he's a lead food, lead footed realist. So he rated myself on the bottom half. Congratulations. That's excellent. Okay. So let's go on to talk about the danger here. Why do we make bad decisions with our intuitions, with our emotions? Why are we overconfident? Well, because we're taught to go with our gut. We're taught to trust our gut, to follow our intuitions. So gurus like Tony Robbins and Malcolm Gladwell tell us to go with our gut, trust our intuition, follow your heart. Malcolm Gladwell tells you to blink, make your decision in blink, to tell, make your decision in the blink of an eye. Tony Robbins tells you to be primal, be savage. That is not great advice. The thing is, trusting our gut feels very comfortable. And we can't tell apart the feeling of when we are actually right from when we just feel comfortable, when we feel good, we feel overconfident. And so that often leads to disasters because our gut is actually not evolved for the modern world. It's evolved for the ancient savanna. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, when we had the fight or flight response to threats, which was life-saving for hunter-gatherers because the risks they faced were immediate, intense in the moment, like saber-toothed tigers. So the overconfidence bias comes from that. That's one of the consequences of the fight or flight response. We did, couldn't take sufficient time to gather evidence to make an accurate judgment. In that environment, when the risks were immediate and tense in the moment, we needed to be overly confident to jump away from moving, to get away from that saber-toothed tiger. So the, kind of, the saber-toothed tiger response was better to jump at 100 shadows than to miss that one saber-toothed tiger. That's not the kind of risks we face in today's world. We face risks that are long-term, uncertain. We face cybersecurity threats for clicking accidentally on an email in our inbox and having malware downloaded on our phones and then on our computers and then uploaded, of course, at cybersecurity leaks. And you all know about that. We face problematic processes that audits might discover. So the risks are long-term and uncertain. And the thing is, we still tend to be way too overconfident. So that is 
quite dangerous for making good decisions in today's world. And that results in dangerous judgment errors, which are called cognitive biases that come from our evolutionary background and how our brains are wired. Now, thinking about that, let's take a look at this poem. Did you ever make a bad decision in the past? And looking back, you realize you really had the information you needed to make a better decision, but you made not the best decision. See, most people voted, two thirds voted. Let's give people five more seconds. Share about your decision making. Okay, so this happened literally to everyone. And that is a good guess that that is an indication of cognitive biases where you had the information you needed to make a good decision, but you didn't make a good decision. And if you had the information you needed to make a good decision and we were not biased, decision makers, you always should make the right decision. But we don't because we fall for cognitive biases. <laughs> so Skyland says, when making bad decisions, it is great to know an excellent divorce attorney. Yes, indeed. <laughs> good, I like that. Okay, so let's talk about some more of these cognitive biases. And the first thing I want to answer is a question that a number of you might have thought about when, if you weren't quite paying attention to Barb's introduction and you just heard me speak. Obviously I have an accent. So a lot of people want to know when I go to Texas, where am I from? I'm happy to tell you. I'm. My dad is from Ukraine, as, Ma, as Barb mentioned. My mom is from Moldova. So Moldova, unfortunately, Ukraine is very famous right now. Moldova is a little country to the southwest of Ukraine. It's so tiny that you need an arrow to point to it on the map. So you could see both Ukraine and Moldova on that map. So that's where my dad and mom is from. And I was born in 1981. And then I came to the United States in 1991, when that part of the world was freed from Russian domination. So I might remember that you know, Mr. Gorbachev tear down that wall, right? And so on, what happened there. Now, I was especially, I was glad when they left and especially in 1996, when I saw a world value survey that year, which showed that of all the countries in the world, Moldova was the least happy, least happy country in the world. <laughs> Don't know why I was 10 when I left, but I'm glad that they left. Now we settled in New York City. And New York City is, as I'm sure you know, a cultural melting pot. It's very different from Columbus, Ohio, or San Antonio, but Columbus, Ohio, where I am right now, it's not a melting pot. It's very homogeneous, not very diverse. But in New York, it's very, it was very diverse. So I, you know, you walk a block, you hear a dozen different accents. Here in Columbus, Ohio, if I settled here, I probably would have worked to try to get rid of my accent. But I still in New York and my parents taught me to be proud of my cultural heritage. So I didn't try to get rid of my accent. And I found out later when I went to UNC Chapel Hill to get my PhD, that was, and everybody started asking me where I'm from because you know it's the Southern way and, and Columbus, Ohio still get that, where am I from? I learned about a concept that I wish I had learned about before called accent discrimination. So it's a false perception of those with foreign accents being less trustworthy. That's of course, it's a false perception. It, it, people with foreign accents aren't actually less trustworthy, but that is how it feels. That's how it feels to us. And it's because of another Savannah aspect, which is tribalism. Because we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And it was very important for us to be tribal. If we weren't sufficiently tribal, well, our tribes would what tribe members would kick us out and we'd die. If we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, those tribes would take our tribe over and we'd die as well. We're the descendants of those who didn't die. We had a strong fight or flight reflex. We had a strong tribalism impulse. 
And that's described in two more cognitive biases called the horns effect and the halo effect. The halo effect and the horns effect. So the horns effect refers to somebody having little horns in their head. If you dislike one characteristic of someone, because generally it happens because that person is different than you in some significant way, you'll tend to have too negative view of their other characteristics. And the halo effect is the opposite. Someone having a little halo on their head. If you like one characteristic of someone, you'll tend to have too positive view of their other characteristics. And this functions in a whole variety of settings. So for example, if you are auditing a department, the people who are doing the auditing, so your audit team, will have a halo effect toward other people who are doing the auditing team, but the people, but the, there's going to be a natural horns effect toward people you're auditing. And the people who are being audited especially will have a natural horns effect toward you. Let's say with IT, there's going to be a natural horns effect toward IT from people who are required to follow cybersecurity guidelines. They're like, oh, these annoying IT people, why are they telling me what to do? And they are not realizing the kind of damage that can come from malware or that ransomware hacks and so on. Quality control. So quality control has a natural halo effect toward others within quality control. And there's a horns effect toward people in operations who just want to get the job done. And there's natural conflicts there. So those are within of relevance to SACA members within organizations, but it happens to all sorts of business relationships. So those are with internal, it happens externally as well. So let me share with you a couple of, an interesting example of that. They should be able to see my screen. And this is going to be a presentation I gave about four years ago in Columbus, Ohio. And like Barb mentioned, you know, you're Longhorns fans. I'm a Buckeye fan. And here in Columbus, Ohio, the Ohio State Buckeyes are the big, big football team. That's is where a lot of fan, a lot of people in Central Ohio are fans. Unfortunately, we didn't do quite as well this year as we could have because Michigan beat us in that last game. Oh, well, uh, but at least now we know why they beat us. They apparently were stealing signs. So, <laughs> so Michigan and Ohio State, this is the biggest rivalry in college football, one the biggest at least. And here I'm presenting in Columbus, Ohio to over, and this is to the Ohio, Central Ohio HR group, SHRM. So their SHRM group, it's called Hraco. So it's their Central Ohio HR group. And there's over, this is the Diversity Inclusion Conference, the 2018 Diversity Inclusion Conference. This is my closing keynote at that conference. And I'm going to ask over 100 people in the room whether they will hire a University of Michigan fan. Let's see what they have to say. We can't hear it. So what did you say? You can't hear me? Oh, yes. Let's uh, thank you for letting me know that. Let's try again. So as you know, I'm a professor at Ohio State. I'm contractually obligated to root for the Buckeyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing there are a lot of Buckeyes fans here, you know. Go Bucks, right? <laughs> Yo, there you go. Now, how likely are you to hire a Michigan fan? See, free people. Now, regardless of how we feel about Michigan fans and their poor, poor choices, <laughs> in which team to root for, does that indicate anything about their performance as an employee? No, I know. Come on, that no should be stronger. <laughs> So, as you can see, over 100 people in the room, only three of them would hire University of Michigan fan, three of them. And this is HR professionals. So HR leaders from 
major companies like Nationwide and so on, they only three of them would hire University of Battelle, only three of them would hire University of Michigan fan. And they gave them a chance to change their mind. It wasn't just an initial visceral reaction. You know, they weren't willing to change their mind. So the halo effect and the horns effect can be very powerful dynamics. And this is something that you want to really be aware of, that it can really harm people and cause people to make a lot of bad choices <laughs> when they're falling for the halo and horns effect. So given that, hold on. let's take 30 seconds to write down where the halo effect and the horns effect might be impacting your decision making, your company's decision making. So please go ahead and write that down. All right, and let's take a poll. So thinking about the halo and horns effect, how valuable would it be for you and your team to address the halo effect and the horns effect? Please go ahead and vote. Would it not be valuable, moderately valuable, or highly valuable? Okay, see most people participated. Let's give five more seconds for people who didn't yet. Okay, so see the overwhelming majority of you would find it highly valuable or moderately valuable. Excellent. So you can take this information and apply it to your team, bring this information back, especially if you think it's highly valuable and start addressing these problems. Good. So Cass, I'm uh, not sure what's up with the poll question and you're not seeing it, but I think large majority of other folks did see it. Okay. So talk about a couple of other cognitive biases, the optimism bias and the pessimism bias. So what's that about? So the optimism bias, it's kind of like it sounds. It's when people have a view of the world where the glass is half full, where the grass is green on the other side of the hill. And this is something that's, by the way, it's not a binary, it's not kind of a binary, it's a range. So people can be moderate, can be extremely optimistic, strongly optimistic, moderately optimistic, they can be moderately pessimistic, moderately strongly pessimistic, or extremely pessimistic. Or if you prefer to call yourself realistic, then it can be moderately realistic, strongly realistic, and extremely realistic. Now, I tend to be strongly optimistic. So that it definitely resonates with me. People like me are very much opportunity-oriented, entrepreneurial, and creative. But we tend to be too risk-blind. So I have I'm the kind of person who wakes up in the morning and I have 26 ideas. I have 20 ideas before breakfast and they all feel brilliant. I've learned to my bitter chagrin that they're not all brilliant, but it all feels brilliant to me. 
Now, pessimism bias. So people who are pessimistic, or again, if you prefer to call yourself realistic, you can do that. These are great people at managing threats, at stabilizing situations and improving them, but they tend to be too risk averse. They see the glass as half empty. They see the grass as yellow on the other side of the hill. And so that's, my wife tends to be strongly pessimistic. So it was definitely a challenge when we were first getting together in the relationship and before I discovered these concepts, that was before I went to UNC Chapel Hill and learn about this, that uh, one of the challenges for me was that I really love surprises. So I'm very, I love surprises, love getting them, love giving them. And it was very hard for me to appreciate that my wife doesn't like surprises. So I kept trying to surprise her. I give her, I try one surprise and she'd be, have a negative reaction. I try another and it just felt to me like, oh, I just gave her the wrong thing or I just did the wrong thing for her. So that was very hard for me. That's And that speaks to how hard it is for optimists to realize the perspective of pessimists. Optimists tend to see the world in, again, as very opportunity oriented. They, we don't, we see it as full of rewards, not full of risks. We experience a lot of frustration when pessimists block our ideas. And pessimists see the world as more full of threats and they tend to experience a lot of anxiety when optimists like me just kind of shoot from the hip and be our gung-ho about our ideas. So there's a lot of problems if you don't know how to work together effectively. You need at least two of each on your team. If you don't have optimists, you won't have innovation, you won't have creativity. If you don't have pessimists, you won't have sufficient skepticism, you won't have sufficient improvement and implementation. The general tendency for optimists and pessimists is that optimists generate ideas and pessimists shoot them down. And there's a lot of fighting when you're on together with between optimists and pessimists on the team. Much, much more effective is an approach where optimists generate ideas. They, they're not, the pessimists are not very good at generating ideas. They might generate one idea to an optimist, 10 ideas, because they see the inherent flaws of each idea. So it takes them a long time to generate an idea, but the ideas they generate are generally good, but they don't generate that many ideas at all. So a much better approach is for, for optimists to focus on generating ideas and pessimists than to focus on evaluating and improving ideas. That's a much better combination. So optimists need to learn to let go of their ideas and trust that pessimists will evaluate and improve them effectively. So for example, for me, well, I own the six people consulting company, disaster avoidance experts, talking about this risk management auditing for in the tech space for tech professionals and auditing professionals. And so what we do is I have my 20 brilliant ideas. It's very tempting for me to just work with other optimists, because, but that won't work well because then we'd have 120 different ideas with six people, 20 ideas before breakfast. We'd be running on 120 different directions and the company would go bankrupt. Much, much more effective is that I give my 20 brilliant ideas to, I hire, make sure to hire pessimists. I give my 20 brilliant ideas to a pessimist and they say, well, these are all half baked potatoes, but you know, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And they're great at working on those ideas to implement them and improve them effectively. So that's their strength. So they choose three of those ideas, two of those ideas, whatever, and they are great at finding the flaws, fixing the flaws and implementing them. So that's how optimists and pessimists are best at working together. Now, thinking about that, how valuable would it be for you and your team to address the optimism bias and the pessimism bias in your organization? Go ahead. Like five, five more seconds to share your thoughts about optimism and pessimism. Oh, 
Okay, so this is even more popular than the previous one. Everyone found it either highly valuable or moderately valuable. That's excellent. So again, take the optimism and pessimism ideas and bring them back to your team and start addressing the challenges you see around them. Good. Okay. So how can we overcome these dangerous judgment errors is another question. Well, you need to learn to go against your intuitions because our intuitions were great for helping humans survive in the early, in that early savanna environment, but they're not great for making decisions in today's world. So think about your intuitions. In some areas, you've already learned to overcome your intuitions at least somewhat. In the early savanna environment, when we came across a source of sugar, like honeys, bananas, it was very important for us to eat as much of it as possible. In, we are the descendants of those who had a very strong trigger response by sugar. In the modern environment, that's a bad idea, given all the overproduction of very processed foods like donuts, right? It's very tempting when you're in the break room and the grateful vendor sent over some donuts for the holidays to you know, have a donut when you come into that break room and then you're triggered by the sugar and you have another donut and then another, and then before you know it, half the box is gone. Not that it ever happened to me, right? Much more effective is to do something like pass by those donuts and go for a bowl of fruit that another grateful vendor has sent over. It's much less triggering, but it's not intuitive. It's something, it's much more intuitive for us to eat the donuts. So you have to overcome that temptation and work on yourself to choose to eat the healthy fruit. And so in the same way, you have to let you overcome your gut intuitions to eat the donuts. You have to overcome your gut intuitions to fall into the halo effect and the horns effect, the overconfidence bias, the optimism bias, and the pessimism bias. And to do so, you'll find really helpful the assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, which focuses on the 30 most dangerous cognitive biases in professional settings. It helps evaluate their extent and impact on your workplace and provide the next steps for addressing them. So let's take a look at this assessment, what it looks like, and so that you can then think about how you can de deploy it effectively. Okay, so you should be able to see the assessment. The directions are for each question, it refers to a problem that might occur in everyday professional situations. And so you want to indicate how often the problem occurred in your workplace in the past year. The answer for each question will be in percentage terms out of all the times that it might have occurred. So we're gonna do a couple of these questions. The answer doesn't have to be precise, uh, to be approximate. Each question should take no more than 10 to 15 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds at maximum. So we'll be using the chat for this. Please share what percentage of projects missed the deadline or went over budget in your organization from your perspective that you can observe in the last year. So please go ahead and put the percentage terms into the chat. So Dustin says 20, John says 50, Dean says 7, Deidre 20, James 40, Leo 40, Kathy 15, Tanea 15, Barb 45, then Daniel says 50. So please go ahead, keep sharing. But you can see that there is a wide range, right? And that range, if it's going to be in the 5 to 10% range, it's kind of not the big deal. It's random variance that happens. If it's 15 to 20, that's getting to be more serious because it means there's mass allocation of resources. And if it's over 20, that becomes a really serious issue in terms of misallocating resources. So this is a cognitive bias known as the planning fallacy, where we tend to be too confident about our plans. Let's go with number three. Of all significant decisions, in what percentage of the cases was someone involved in the decision overconfident about the decision? Go ahead, please. 
share your answers. 35%, 50%, 10%. So Deidre says 50%, James 35%, John 10%, Dean 50%, Dustin 15, Dustin 40, Daniel 40, Kathy 25, Leslie 50, Barb 50, Leo 25, Scott 50. And you'll see a lot of, again, 80% for Brenda. So again, the same idea. If it's five to 10%, not a big deal. 15 to 20, it becomes more of a serious issue and more than 20, it's really serious. So this is about, of course, the overconfidence bias. And there's gonna be 28 more questions like this. So it's very helpful for you to get a grasp on the problems that are happening and to know which of the problems are the biggest for your organization so that you can take the next steps to address them. Now, thinking about this assessment, how valuable do you think it would be for you and your team to take the assessment and address the cognitive biases it uncovers? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, five more seconds, share your thoughts. Okay, so again, everyone will find it valuable, a little bit less valuable than the optimism bias and the pessimism bias in terms of the shift between highly valuable and moderately valuable. So again, especially if you find highly valuable, You'll get a copy of the assessment and then you'll be able to take it back to your team and help them address it. Great. Okay. And then I want to give you a tool that you can use to make quick decisions effectively that address a number of these cognitive biases at once. So these are five questions to avoid decision disasters. It's excellent for you to use by yourselves or to have use with your team together to make decisions. So if you use it by yourself, you'll just go through it. It'll take you a couple of minutes to go through it and ask the five questions that you need on any decision that you don't want to screw up. Whether you're writing an email to a client that you want to make sure goes well, you're making a proposal, but also something larger like thinking about various project steps in an auditing project or a cybersecurity project, you can make these decisions. If you're making these decisions as part of a team, just have everyone answer the questions in advance of the meeting and then come to the meeting with the questions answered in hand. And then you'll just discuss each question turn by turn and you'll come away with a, the consensus and it'll be much quicker than typical decision-making meeting and you'll be much more confident about making the right decision. First question, what important information didn't I yet fully consider? We tend to not fully consider information that goes against our intuitions. We tend to make a business case, support our decisions. That's great if you want to convince someone, but not great if you want to make the right decision. So you want to instead try to disconfirm your beliefs, try to prove yourself wrong. Look for evidence that disconfirms your beliefs and weigh that much more heavily. Also look for information that's important. Don't look for all information. Don't want to get stuck in analysis paralysis. So decide what, what information is important and focus on that. Second, what dangerous judgment errors did I yet address? So what cognitive biases might be in play? If you're making a decision, it might be about another person. It might be the halo effect and the horns effect. If you're too optimistic, it might be the optimism bias, whatever it might be. Next, what would a trusted and objective advisor suggest I do? So think about that little angel on your shoulder. What would they suggest you do in this situation? What would someone who is a peer in the Sasaka chapter who you trust suggest you do in this situation? 
And you get much of the benefit just by thinking about that, but you can also just call this person or text this person if you're under 40. How have I addressed all the ways this could fail? So think about the ways this could fail and address them in advance. This can help you prevent failure and it's a very effective tool. Finally, what new information caused me to revisit this decision? So just because you make a decision doesn't mean you have to be stuck. We tend to fall into post-factum rationalization after we make a decision and we are stuck with the decision, but we don't have to be. If you decide in advance that certain information will cause you to revisit the decision, you'll be much better off because you'll be able to change your mind much more quickly and effectively. Okay. And then how valuable would it be for you and your team to use the five questions to avoid decision disasters technique to make good enough decisions? Please go ahead and vote. Okay, most people voted. Let's give five more seconds. Share your thoughts if you haven't yet. Okay, this is the most popular one yet. Definitely everyone finds it valuable and more people find highly valuable than any other ones. Excellent, I'll send you the decision aid that you can use to for this question. Great. Okay, I'll send you some free additional resources as I mentioned, the assessment and dangerous judgment errors, the decision aid and five key questions, and a copy of my best selling book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. And there's going to be a free coaching session available for the first three people. You don't. So if you're watching this as a recording after the presentation, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event. But otherwise, I'll just send it to you from the registration sheet. So don't worry if you're here present right now. But if you're watching this as a recording, go to tinyurl.com forward slash DAE event and type in your information there. Okay, I'll be happy to take any questions, remaining questions at this stage. You can type your questions into the chat or unmute yourself, whatever you're more comfortable with. Dr. Glebo, we're waiting for people. Oh, there we go for one. Um, really quick, <clears throat> is it possible to share the slide deck so that we can put that yes. and make it available? Yeah. And then also we can add that free additional resources link uh, or website to, to that information as well. Mm -hmm. okay. So, Sure, Barb. So Cass asks, what about the effect on bias from peer pressure? Sure, it was there in the sharp meeting example. Well, there were free people who were willing to share and I think it was going to be people were either raising their hands or not raising their hands, but there were definitely people who were raising their hands. So it wasn't like no one. And it wasn't particularly a probium in terms of it's obviously doesn't matter for your it obviously shouldn't matter whether someone's a Michigan fan for you to be vote for you to hire them. Right. So it's kind of quite problematic for you to be an HR professional and say that you will not hire someone who's a Michigan fan just because you're a Michigan fan. That kind of goes against very clear ethical guidelines, but people are still not willing to do it. Other folks. Maybe if it's a football coach they're trying to hire, we would say no. Uh -huh. Sure. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, that's nice, interesting. 
Suddenly, so thank you for that comment, Atenea, <laughs> if, I, if I pronounced your name correctly. How most people think that going from gut decisions is best? Well, that's because it feels comfortable, it feels right, and people just trust their feelings. They trust how they feel, and they just go with what they feel. The large majority of people, that's, that's just how they roll. <laughs> Other questions? You can mute yourself or put it in the chat. Five more seconds. You're welcome, Leo. Yeah, definitely the biases are what involves some racial biases. That's the halo effect and the horns effect. All right. Doesn't look like a, there are any further questions. Barb, do you want to close us out? Yeah. So once again, Dr. Gleb, thank you so much for your time today um, and for everybody who was able to join in on the call. Um, Dr. Gleb will be working with us to get the CPE certificates to you for today's session. And we will be contacting you hopefully within the next two weeks with that information. Um, if not, just um, give us some time just due to the holidays um, that are coming up and people being out. But thank you again. We hope everybody has a great holiday season and a happy new year. We will see everybody in 2024 with the joint IIA meeting um, in January. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.